Have you ever been in the kitchen when something overflows on the stove, or explodes in the microwave, or just tastes weird or wonderful? If yes, you've witnessed a chemical reaction. If taste is what makes cooking an art, then chemistry is what makes cooking a science. Success or failure in the kitchen is due to three elements reacting with each other. Ingredients, time, and temperature. If you can measure those three things accurately, you can be a whiz in the kitchen. Take these chocolate cupcakes. I made them a few hours ago, but in order to make them, I had to start here, measuring sugar, flour, vanilla, and a number of other ingredients. And I also needed to measure the temperature, bake at 350 degrees, and the time for 18 minutes. If I didn't know how to measure them correctly, I might have wound up with something like this. Perfectly lovely and just the wrong size. So what's my point? Math is a huge part of cooking and measurements are a big part of math. If your measurements are accurate, your reaction is good. If your measurements are wrong, you have ruined your dinner. And that's why kitchen math is important. By understanding how to measure ingredients, time, and temperature, you take the guesswork out of cooking and you're on your way to becoming a fabulous chef. Listen to this. Centuries ago, in China, people would use sound to measure how much liquid or grain was in a container. If the container had the right pitch, you know, the fuller it gets, the higher the sound, they knew the amount was correct. So why'd they do this? Because there was no formal system of measurement. The measuring system we use today hadn't been invented yet. You know, ounces, cups, gallons, was not in existence. In fact, long ago, people used their body parts to measure. The width of a hand, the thickness of a finger, the length of a foot. But that, of course, posed a problem because what if my hand's bigger than yours? I have a feeling my feet probably are. Clocks and thermometers are also recent inventions. Instead of today's digital timer, an hourglass might have been used. Can you imagine timing your eggs? So in the old days, recipes were pretty vague. In fact, cookbooks weren't used or written. Many cooks were illiterate. Cooks were part of an oral tradition. They would speak their recipes, not write them. 300 years ago, when you were being taught how to cook, your mom or dad might have said, OK, you take a young hen, and you bone it in the usual way, and you add enough liquid to cover, and two handfuls of new tomatoes, and enough stoned olives to deepen the flavor, and plenty of garlic. OK, what kind of a recipe is that? What's enough liquid to cover? Are you putting it in a bathtub, or are you putting it in a small pot? And what's plenty? How much is plenty? The only measurement you have there is that you have one hen. That's the only thing you knew for certain. So measurements at one point in history were not precise. A measuring system needed to be invented, and it was. In the 1300s, the imperial system, also known as the English system, was created in Britain. And this is a system of weights and measures that use specific calibrated units, such as ounces, inches, pounds, quarts, gallons. Those are the ones that we still use today. And there are a few other dates that are important in the history of measurement. 1718, when Fahrenheit, the Fahrenheit temperature scale, was invented by Gabriel Daniel Fahrenheit. 1742, a few years later, the centigrade temperature scale was invented by Anders Celsius. And in 1793, the metric system was invented in France. And this is, of course, the measuring system that uses units such as meters, kilograms, kilometers, liters. And most countries around the world, with the exception of the United States, use this. But measurements in the kitchens really changed. The techniques of measuring changed within the last 30 years. Prior to that, most chefs had a basic understanding of what ingredients were and how they reacted with one another. And they knew it in their heads and by experience. Almost everything was oral. It was all at their fingertips. Okay? Your chef would look at you and he would say, put in enough of this until it tastes right and taste it again and again. And then I will tell you if that's the right taste. And you'd learn it by taste. Now, all you have to do is pull out a cookbook or turn on a computer to get a recipe. And you can read the measurement charts right there and understand them. But you still have to understand the basics of how to measure, and that's what we're going to get into right now. <music> At 
At one time or another, you have probably watched a cooking show on television where a chef, just like the one I was talking about, grabbed a handful of stuff and tossed it into a pot. And then he says, all right, we don't need exact measurements. We do everything by taste, right? Well, this is fine. Chefs have a lot of experience. They have umpteen years of experience. They also have a good understanding of how ingredients react together. And they also have a good idea of what a teaspoon of salt looks like when it's mounted up in a hand. It's the same way that a butcher can grab a pound of meat and put it on a scale and get it within half an ounce every time. But if you don't think the butcher weighs it, after a year, those half ounces add up to a lot of money. And the butcher can't afford to be even a half ounce off. So even though he's pretty accurate, he always weighs it. Just like a teaspoon of salt may be small, but it can still affect your recipe. It's got to be measured. By the way, I want to pause here because we're going to start in just a second and we'll have a little lecture about kitchen hygiene. When you're in a kitchen, you are dealing with food. It is very important to make sure everything, hands, utensils, are kept as clean as possible. You wash before cooking, during cooking, and after you've handled food, okay? Washing your hands is actually pretty important. Get enough soap on them to make a good lather and then go on the back of the fingers, between the fingers, Pinch your fingers together so your fingernails dig in the palm of your hand so the fingernails will be clean and go up around the wrists. What they teach us in professional kitchens is to sing the happy birthday song to ourselves. And it should take the whole length of the song before we're done. You shut it off with your wrist, not with your hands. And then dry on a paper towel, which you throw away. All right, now back to measurements. There are three kinds of measurements three techniques that are used by professional cooks. These are estimated measurements, ratios, and calibrated measurements, which in America means the English system or the imperial system of measurement. Most countries use the metric system. In fact, I have many friends from other countries who have gone crazy trying to learn ours. America uses the English system. Now, we went over estimated measurements. These are the most casual kind. That's where you grab stuff, you throw it in, and you adjust until it tastes right. It's estimation taste based, based on taste and experience. Now, this is great for some things like soup, because you cook the soup, then you finish it right at the very end. You can do your adjusting at the end. When you're baking, if your pie doesn't have enough sugar, you're sunk. You've already applied the heat, Everything is already over, the process is at an end, and there is no way to fix the recipe once it's done. So it needs to be measured. If you don't start right, you're sunk. So estimated measurements are based on taste. Another kind of measurement is the ratio. Cooks love ratios. Cooks know pie dough as three to one dough. That's what we call it. Make me, make me 20 pounds of three to one dough. Three parts flour. Two parts shortening, one part water. Does not matter whether you start with three ounces of flour or three train cars of flour, the recipe still works. Three parts, two parts, one part. Works with rice, too. Two parts water, one part rice. Two tons water, one ton rice. And at the end of it, you get three parts of whatever you have done, whether it's train cars or tons. We have estimated measurements, we have ratios. But the most common kind comes with this kind of stuff. In American kitchens, we use the English system of measurements and weights, and these are precise. Now, look at the chart. This is what you're going to want to memorize, and I apologize to you, I had to do it too. You want to understand teaspoons in a tablespoon, how many? You want to understand how many tablespoons in an ounce, how many ounces in a cup, how many tablespoons in a cup, how many cups in a pint, Pints in a quart, cups in a quart, quarts in a gallon, ounces in a pound. And you also need to know that a quart is almost a liter. On many of these kinds of measuring containers, you'll have metric on one side and you'll have English on the other. And the point where they almost meet is that a quart is almost as much as a liter. So there's a way to judge back and forth a little bit. So those are some of the most important ratios that you need to know. I'm not saying that they're easy to remember because they aren't, which is why you might want to invent some little games. For instance, how do you remember a teaspoon is smaller than a tablespoon? Well, okay, a teacup goes on top of a table, right? Table bigger than cup. And how do you remember that there are three teaspoons, and whoever chose that number, how do you remember that there are three teaspoons in a tablespoon? All right, there are three letters in T, T-E-A. 
Okay, so three teaspoons make a tablespoon. Once you've invented enough of those little memory games, the English system will come pretty easily. And if it helps, pause the video and look at it. But you know how many inches are in a foot. You already know that. You know probably how many feet are in a mile. You know how many seconds are in a minute. So just take a little time, memorize these things, and it will make your job in the kitchen a whole lot easier. Quarts in a gallon, uh, gallons in a mile, uh, never mind. So cups, gallons, ounces, pounds. That's the English system. It's what's used in America. Learn it, love it. Now, as I said earlier, most other countries use the metric system. I'm not going to spend a lot of time explaining it here. Remember that the metric system is based on tens. Decimal system, 10, 10, 100, 1,000. You know it as meters, kilometers, uh, grams, kilograms, liters. Most measuring devices have, well, a lot of measuring devices like this one have both on it. These other things that you'll see do not. There are certain measuring tools you'll find in almost every kitchen. They are timers to measure time, thermometers to measure temperature, and measuring containers to measure ingredients. That's timers, thermometers, and containers. We'll talk about timers first. A recipe will give you the time. It'll say boil for 10 minutes, bake for one hour, microwave for two minutes. Measure the time. If you don't, your meal will be undercooked or overcooked, mushy or burnt. Now let's look at thermometers. They measure hot and cold temperatures inside the food and out. You can find them on the stove, in the oven, in the microwave, or not built in like this. For the most part, when you're cooking, you're dealing with heat, and the recipe will tell you how much heat you need to use. Here are some basic temperatures from slow to moderate to hot. These are oven temperatures. A very slow oven is from 250 to 275 degrees. You use that for things like pot roast and prime rib. A slow oven is from 300 to 325 degrees. These would be items that are big, like turkey and ham. The moderate oven is the one that you see for baking most often. 350 is the average temperature in every recipe in the universe. 350 to 375, you'll find things like chocolate chip cookies, bread. A hot oven, 400 to 425, you're starting to see French bread and pizza, 450 to 475, pizza again. And a really hot oven, 500 degrees, there you're starting to broil. And that's where you'll see things like steaks, chicken breasts, kebabs. By the way, you're pretty much always going to get smoke in the house when the oven is at 450 degrees, unless it's absolutely clean. You might also want to remember another few temperatures. Water freezes at 32 degrees Fahrenheit or 0 degrees Celsius. Water boils at 212 degrees Fahrenheit, 100 degrees Celsius. Okay, last but not least come the measuring containers. You're looking at mainly a couple of groups. Cups and measuring spoons. These will measure volume for you accurately and you're also going to need a scale accurately to measure weight. So. Let's start with dry measuring sets. They're usually made of metal or plastic, and they come ordinarily, this is the most common kind, in four sizes. One cup, half cup, third cup, and a quarter cup. Now, excuse me before we get started here, I want to wash my hands. We're going to be measuring three categories of ingredients, dry, moist, and wet. And we're going to start with dry ingredients, and we're going to begin with flour. When you're measuring flour, first you want to dip your measuring container in and get out a generous amount. See, I have too much right there. Then you scrape it off so it's level. You dip, scoop, and scrape, and I'm scraping with the back of a knife. So in it goes like that. Now, don't pack or tap your dry ingredients, especially flour. If you do, it's going to settle and you're going to end up with too much. If the recipe calls for sifted flour, that's another story. What you're doing is you're adding air to the flour to make it lighter, and you want to do the sifting process before you measure. That way, when you, when you add one cup of sifted flour, what you bake is going to be lighter. So now you measure it. Now let's turn to moist ingredients. Moist ingredients like brown sugar, 
chopped parsley, cooked rice, do need to be packed in to get an accurate measurement. Especially with brown sugar, you can see that it comes in little clumps. It's kind of lumpy right now, and you're not going to get an accurate measurement unless you push it down in. And many recipes will actually specify brown sugar firmly packed. Pretty firm. Okay, let's turn to the wet or liquid ingredients. Here you're going to use a clear container. And these have pouring spouts on them just to make things easier. What you do to measure them is you pour in the amount that you want, and then to take your measurement, you get down at the level of the line to read it. Now, if you can see that, it is actually a little bit above a cup. So I need to pour it out. Now, when you're reading this level, if you do it particularly with water, you'll see a, there's a little bit of a bow in the surface. That's called the meniscus. You always read from the lowest level of that bow, lowest level of the meniscus, to get an accurate measurement. So there, I've got my one cup. That's basically all there is to measuring liquid ingredients. It's really quite easy. Measuring spoons used for both dry and wet ingredients. Let's say your recipe calls for a tablespoon of salt or a teaspoon of vanilla. On this set, I have a couple of kinds of measuring spoons. This is probably the most typical set. Tablespoon, teaspoon, half teaspoon, quarter teaspoon. This one actually goes all the way down to an eighth of a teaspoon. This is really easy. We'll use salt. Take your spoon, put it over a container that can catch, fill it till it's just about the level you think you want. Slight bit over, and then once again, with the back of a knife, level it off. That's all there is to it. Now, some things, like baking powder, will provide you a way to level it off right in the can. You just reach inside there, get a good mound, and then as you take it out, you scrape it against this handy dandy little thing right here, and it comes out level just like that. Those are your spoon basics. Now, let's move on to scales. There are a wide variety of kitchen scales available. This is the most common kind. You can get digitals, and this is a spring scale. These can be used to weigh practically anything, big or small, but you always have to look at the range. How high does it go up? This one goes up to about five pounds, okay? A lot of them go up to only 32 ounces, two pounds. So if you see that, if you have a scale and it goes up to 32 ounces, don't weigh your little brother on it, it won't work. If you need to weigh something that is loose, say dry beans, what you do is you first weigh the container that you're gonna put them in, okay? So you take the weight on that, which is about four ounces. And then you add a measured amount of beans, let's say half a cup. And then you can take the weight. The way you would take the weight is you take the total weight and you subtract the weight of the container. An easier way to do this is to put the bowl in and then reset it to zero. These will have sliding scales on them. All I'm doing is moving this pan down here back to zero. Now, when I add the beans, all I'm weighing is the beans themselves because I've put the scale at zero so that it's not counting the weight of the bowl at all. This is called tearing. It's when you allow for the weight of a container or a rapid. You've reset the scale so it's zero and you're just weighing what's in it now. A scale can also show you the difference between dry and liquid weights. A cup, for instance, of dry beans does not equal the same weight as a cup of liquid beans or refried beans. This will be a little bit less than 8 ounces. This will be almost exactly 8 ounces. And that's because dry ingredients have a lot of air space in them. But there are no air pockets here. So you can't substitute one measure for the other. Dry and liquids don't weigh the same. A liquid measure tells you both volume and weight. A dry measure will give you either one or the other. All right. 
Now, you know a whole lot about measurements and measuring devices. Let's put it all together and actually cook something. You may have made pancakes before, possibly from a mix like this, but let's make it this time from scratch, the real stuff. We are going to start by reviewing the recipe. Start at the top. Okay, as you can see, this recipe for whole wheat honey pancakes makes eight six inch pancakes. Now that's supposed to serve two people. In other words, you and a friend are gonna get four pancakes each. Now let's review the ingredients. Three quarters of a cup of all purpose flour, a quarter cup of whole wheat flour, half a teaspoon of baking soda, quarter teaspoon of salt, one egg, cup of low fat milk, two tablespoons vegetable oil, two tablespoons honey, nonstick cooking spray. Now, let's make this recipe a little bit harder. Let's say a friend calls up and tells you she's coming over. So all of a sudden, you have to change how much the recipe yields. How do you do that? Well, with kitchen math. You first figure out the calculations before you do any measuring. And the way to do that, of course, is to start with the original recipe and calculate the new amounts. You might want to pause the video and make a little test for that out of yourself. Take the time to figure it out yourself. If not, I'll help you. I'll give you the answers. And this is the way you do it. You now have a recipe for two people that needs to become three, right? That means we're going to need how many six inch pancakes? Well, okay, this recipe yields eight, right? So each person gets four, and you now have three people, three times four. Four plus four plus four equals 12. We need to scale up the recipe, that means, by one and a half times. Not necessarily the easiest number. So let's go on with it. You're gonna be serving three people and so you need one and a half recipes. Each person gets a half recipe. One and a half times every measurement you have here. You're gonna to wanna to multiply every fraction by one and a half. Do this and this is what you get. One and one eighths cup all-purpose flour. Now these measurements require that you have paid attention in the past because what's an eighth of a cup? There's one, and again, we level it off. Now, if you remember, there are eight ounces in a cup. There are two tablespoons in an ounce. So the easiest way to do this is to make tablespoons out of it. So we have one, two, because an eighth of a cup is an ounce or two tablespoons. So we have one and an eighth cup flour. Three eighths of a cup of whole wheat flour. All right, we'll start with a quarter cup. That's the easy part. And we'll fill it up and we'll level it off. And then we go back to the tablespoons again. So fill. Yeah, spill and level and then how many more two, 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 two. two more tablespoons there's the first one and again level and there's the second one and again level all right that's our second ingredient three quarters of a teaspoon of baking soda. Now, if you'll notice on this keyring, there is no spoon that says three quarters of a teaspoon. You need to use a half teaspoon measure and add it to a quarter teaspoon measure. So, here's the half. Take it out, put it over something that will catch the spills. Not quite. And level it off. And then find your quarter and do exactly the same thing. 
Next comes three eighths of a teaspoon of salt. A quarter is two eighths, and this set of spoons actually has an eighth teaspoon measure, which makes this whole thing really handy. So for salt, once again, the procedure is put it over something that can catch the spill, fill it almost all the way up, level it off, in it goes. Next is the eighth. Do that exactly the same way. Pouring a little bit more slowly because this is a pretty tiny little spoon. And in it goes. Now the next thing is in another container, an egg. Now in the original recipe we had an egg. In this recipe we have an egg and a half. How do you think you're going to do this? And they're going to have. Well, we can either hard boil it and saw it in half, or you can be aware that what an egg, a large egg, is weighing on average is two ounces. When you see an egg in a recipe that's been put out by a big company, it's almost always a large egg. And the weight of it, after it's been taken out of the shell and beaten, is two ounces. So we want three ounces. Two ounces is also a quarter cup. So what we'll do is we'll get a little bowl, and we will beat both eggs in it, and then we'll measure out three ounces from there. So one and a half eggs. Crack your egg on the side of the bowl, stick your thumbs in at the break, open it up like that, and do it once again. Then beat them up. You can save yourself this step if you're going to use liquid eggs. Just pour them right out of the jar. That's what most restaurants are doing nowadays. And then you want to pour in three ounces. So I am going to go down here and look at my measure down there. And I'm right at three ounces. And that goes in a separate bowl where I'm going to keep the liquid ingredients. Next is the low-fat milk. It's now one and a half cups. So here is our one cup. And then I need to add half more. Next come the honey and the vegetable oil. But I'm going to do them in reverse order. And the reason for that is that oil will actually help the honey come off the spoon. Honey's very sticky, and the oil will help it come off, and you'll get a more accurate measurement. Notice that I'm measuring over the cup. I'm not measuring over the ingredients, because if I overpour and it spills into my ingredients, I've messed up my amount. So I have changed from two now to three tablespoons each of oil and honey. So that's one. That's two. And three. And next comes the honey. And I'm going to do it the same way for the same reasons. One. Notice how well it came off? Just a drop left on there. And two. And watch on the last spoonful of honey how I stop just a little bit before and let it settle. It's easy to overfill on honey because it comes out almost like a solid, and then it sort of oozes to fill the extra places. So there's our third. Now we beat these all together, and then we pour the liquid ingredients gradually into the dry. And as you do so, you want to beat them vigorously so that the lumps come out and add the liquid gradually. This is the part where it's handy to have either an electric mixer or a little brother. Or simply a little fortitude. So there we are. It was a little bit of work, but we have what we, what we need here now. 
So let's turn it on and make pancakes. Since you've gone to the trouble of making your own pancakes, why not show off a little bit and make your own syrup? It's easy. It's a recipe you can remember anywhere, and it's tremendously tasty, and you can impress your friends. So one cup of white sugar, one cup of brown sugar, one cup of water, one cup of corn syrup. Now this is sticky stuff and you want to make sure that you get it all out by using a rubber scraper on it. And then the final ingredient is called mapleine. It's an, a maple flavor, so what you're doing is you're making a maple flavored syrup. Mix it well. Bring it to a boil so that all of the sugar has dissolved and you're done. So far, to this point, we've measured and prepared the ingredients. Now it's time to measure the heat. The recipe calls for a medium-high temperature. So you want to heat up a large skillet or, in this case, an electric griddle with medium-high heat. This one has a temperature dial on it and it goes up to 400. I'm setting it for 325. Next, we're going to spray the pan lightly with cooking oil. And then, we're going to measure out a quarter cup for each pancake, two ounces, quarter cup. And then the last measurement will be time. Pancakes don't take a lot of time, maybe five minutes total, maybe even a little bit less, so get ready to move fast. We're going to take a quarter cup for each pancake and pour it onto our heated griddle. And then we're going to watch for the small bubbles to appear that tell you that the batter is cooked through on one side. Okay, now I'm going to give you a pancake don't. We'll turn the second one, see the little bubbles are appearing on the top. Over we go. Now this is something that practically every kid does. I did it too. You take the pancake and because you want it to be done real fast, you push down to squirt the batter out on the inside. What this does is it compresses your pancake, and instead of being light and fluffy, it's hard and dense like a quilt. So if you'd rather eat pancakes than quilts, just leave them alone, and they'll cook very nicely. They only take about a minute on the second side. Okay, now you're almost done. Just remove and serve. See? Perfect pancakes. You made them yourself. Perfectly measured to serve three hungry people. Eat up. That just about ends our video. Let's quickly recap some of the things you've learned. First, there are three things we measure in the kitchen. Ingredients, time, and temperature. Why? Because if these measurements are accurate, you take a lot of the guesswork out of cooking. You also heard a little about the history of measurements and the type of measurements now used. Estimated, ratios, and in America, the English system. You should be aware of the different units of measurement within the English system, such as teaspoons, tablespoons, quarts, gallons. And I'm hopeful that you even memorized one or two. You should also be able to recognize different measuring devices in the kitchen and how they're used, especially the difference between measuring dry ingredients and liquid ingredients. And pancakes. You learn to make pancakes and you increase the recipe by one half to make sure you had enough for a friend. That's a lot to learn, but now you know something about kitchen math and you can call yourself a seasoned cook. Have fun in the kitchen. Thanks for watching.